Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Shakespeare Hour Live. This is episode number 46 on Remember This, The Lesson of Jan Karski. My name is Drew Lichtenberg. I'm the resident dramaturg at the Shakespeare Theatre Company. And Simon Godwin is currently in London working on a top secret project at the National Theatre. He has sworn us all to silence and secrecy. So unfortunately, he won't be joining us live tonight. However, uh, filling Simon's irreplaceable uh, void is an esteemed group of guests uh, who will be diving in for the next hour on the subject of Jan Karski, uh, of the Holocaust, uh, remembrance bearing witness today uh, to the legacy of Karski and this extraordinary show that is currently playing at the Michael R. Klein Theater. Before we get started, a word of thanks to our sponsors. Uh, the Shakespeare Hour Live is made possible through the visionary support of the Beach Street Foundation. We thank them as always. And the Shakespeare Theater Company's 2021-22 season is made possible by the support of Michael R. Klein and Joan Fabry and the Harmon Family Foundation. So uh, you are, we are thinking of you tonight uh, as we have this conversation. Now, let me introduce, if I will, our panelists. Joining us tonight first is Derek Goldman, the chair of Georgetown University's Department of Performing Arts and director of the Theater and Performance Studies Program, as well as the co-founding director of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics. He is an award-winning stage director, playwright, scholar, and producer, and the director and co-author of Remember This, The Lesson of Jan Karski. Derek, are you there? I am. Hi, Drew. It's great to, great to be with you all. And uh, you seem to be in some kind of uh, interesting uh, location. Could, could you share with our audience where in the world Derek Goldman is right now? Uh, Drew, I am in the dressing room opposite Mr. Strathairn's dressing room um, uh, at curtain time. They've just called places uh, in, the, in the bowels of the, of the Michael Klein Theater. Ah, so this is very exciting. This is the first time in 46 episodes that we have somebody in an actual theater as the show is happening, joining us, uh, sort of giving us a backstage glimpse at the, uh, the mundanity behind the magic, if you will, of live theater. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's, I feel there's this part of me that's like, what's David doing upstairs? But I'm just trusting that to the, to the theater gods and delighted to be here and focused with you while we have Karski being shared upstairs. Right, well, we can feel the, uh, the aura, the magic of David emanating through your Indeed. screen. So, so thank you, Derek, for, for joining us. I also want to introduce uh, Ijoma Njaka, the Inclusive Pedagogy Specialist for the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics at Georgetown University. And with Derek, uh, Ijoma has co-conceived and co-teaches the Georgetown University course on Jan Karski titled Bearing Witness, the Legacy of Jan Karski Today. Ijoma, are you there? I am. Hey, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you tonight. Yeah. And uh, I assume I already know the answer, but where are you joining us uh, from? If you are in Washington, D.C. Uh, or the, the DMV area, what, what neighborhood are you joining yeah. us from? Uh, I'm up in Cleveland Park. Um, so I'm in my designated corner of the apartment. My husband and I both work from home. And so this is this is my sort of my area. <laughs> he has a separate corner uh, yeah. on the other side of our living room, just behind me. So, so your husband is somewhere off screen, just like David Strait there, and is haunting Derek Goldman as we speak. Uh, your husband is haunting you. Uh, yes, yes, he's haunting me from just, just off screen right <laughs> over there the on the couch. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Ijoma. Cannot wait to talk to you about, about the show. Also joining us, Jacek Novakowski, who is currently the Senior Curator for Collections at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Jacek has held several roles at the museum over his career, was an active part in the development of the museum's main permanent exhibition, frequently represents the museum on international projects related to the Holocaust documentation and remembrance, and knew personally Jan Karski. Jacek, hello, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm also excited. I'm not in the theater, unfortunately, but I saw the play already and I might still go again because it, it is something that reminds me of Karski very much. Right, well, thank you, Jacek. And we can't, we're, we're so delighted that you're able to join us and share your memories uh, of the man that you knew. Uh, and 
Also joining us, uh, Clark Young, playwright, co-creator of Remember This, The Lesson of Young Karski, co-teacher of the course at Georgetown University, and an internationally produced playwright, writer, and teacher. Clark, hello. Hello. Good to be here. And now, uh, where you also seem to be uh, somewhere in the bowels of the Klein uh, Theater, Clark. Is that correct? It's interesting you should mention that. Uh, David just locked me in here. I was giving him too many line notes. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so this is where I've been for since the matinee at noon. I haven't eaten or had water. All right. So, so the hostage video, Clark Young, uh, is uh, is uh, commencing a pace, uh, and it, it is actually fascinating, uh, in all seriousness, Derek and Clark, to see the ways in which you have been shepherding this play throughout the process. Normally, after a show opens, you kind of the director and the playwright kind of just flutter away like butterflies but you have been very hands-on. You've been there uh, continuously, it seems, at the theater. I don't know if you go home and, and sleep or eat or, or shower or do any of those uh, human things, but it seems like you are an emanation of this production, uh, leading post-show talks, uh, uh, being present with David as he is, is acting in the show. So it's, it's appropriate in some ways that you are both at the client theater. Uh, I also want to introduce uh, my esteemed colleague, STC's line producer, also in Cleveland Park, Grace Ann Roberts. Or did you move, Grace Ann, to a different part I, of DC? I did move. I'm in Arlington now, but I have previously broadcasted from Cleveland Park for the last 18 months. So Ijeoma, I'm I've been right there with you the whole time. Um, it's so good to be with you all. Um, I want to say viewer Mary has chimed in and said she's so excited to be here tonight, especially right after seeing the play we're all about to discuss. So some people in the audience who have already been to the Klein to see, remember this. So looking forward to it. Thanks everyone. That's right. And, and if you haven't seen the play, what are you doing? Rush out to the theater. It's only playing through the end of this week. Uh, it's playing November in Chicago at Chicago Shakespeare. So maybe you can fly to Chicago uh, this winter to see it there. But this is, it's, it's going fast. First watch the Shakespeare Hour Live and then go see this extraordinary piece of theater. Uh, well, just a little bit of context on Remember This, The Lesson of Young Karski. It, it's, a, it's a piece that tells the story of Karski, who was a Polish citizen and eventual emigre to the United States, uh, a Catholic who bore witness to uh, remarkable, unforgettable, traumatizing sites, arguably, and then continued to uphold uh, this legacy of remembrance for the rest of his career. Eventually, Karski taught, uh, I believe, in the political science uh, department at Georgetown University. Uh, he also famously appeared towards the end of his life, or the last 15 years of his life, in Claude Lanzmann's landmark epic documentary, Shoah, about the Holocaust. And one of the interesting things about this show is that it's a one-man show featuring an extraordinary performance by the Oscar-nominated actor, David Strathairn. Uh, and I was talking to Derek and some of David's actually extended family members today after the matinee about how really you've never seen David Strathairn like this. He's giving it all of his uh, emotional life and range as an actor, but also the, the way he physically inhabits the role of Karski and all these other figures from history is truly uh, something to be seen in the theater. So I thought I'd start Jacek with you since you knew the man uh, and since you worked uh, at the museum, uh, if you could maybe contextualize for us a little bit the importance of Karski's life. Why is it so significant in relationship to the Holocaust? What did he do that was so remarkable? And what did he bear witness to? Karski was uh, really a remarkable person. He was, uh, he was a person that you can call a righteous person. Uh, as uh, one of his colleagues at Georgetown, uh, he said that he is the only noble person that uh, he has known. And Karski was really all of that. Uh, he uh, had an incredible memory. He's, uh, he could work as a recorder or as, uh, as a camera and then relate whatever he has seen and listened to, to the others. Uh, his main mission was uh, quite remarkable because he has met with 
uh, more than a dozen uh, different leaders of different political parties from far left to far right, and also included leaders of two uh, Jewish political parties in it. And then he was meeting with their counterparts in London because there was a Polish government in exile uh, during the war that resided in war London. And attached to that government was something that was called uh, the Polish National Committee. And that committee was a quasi parliament and the representatives of all those parties resided in it. And Karski had to relate to them the message. Uh, and as you might uh, suspect, the political messages from far left and far right would be quite different. Uh, he has never mixed any information uh, giving to, to those people. He was always truthful. He was always to the point. And that was the reason that he was asked again and again to be the courier and uh, take, take the, the message. At the last time when uh, he left uh, Poland for London, he was taken to the Warsaw Ghetto and uh, to a transit camp on the way to a killing center. Uh, he was taken then by the Jewish leaders with whom he has met because they, uh, they thought that uh, someone who will convey their tragedy to the free world, to the Western world, has to see and has to be the witness of that tragedy. So Karski spent two days in the Warsaw Ghetto observing everything, what, what was going on there, some very tragic scenes. He spent uh, several hours in the uh, transit camp of Izbica uh, in the east of Poland, of today's Poland. And he also remembered that uh, he conveyed it to the uh, leaders, Western leaders, to the Polish leaders, to the Jewish leaders in London. But this part of the message stayed with him forever. He had it with him forever. He was the perpetual witness to, to, what, to what happened during the Holocaust. And he was fulfilling that role talking about it, uh, uh, correcting those who were wrong about it, and understanding really what, what happened. Wow, so the, the, the single man uh, who really was just a, a conduit for information becomes a figure of world historical, I think it's fair to say, significance as a, as a conduit to world leaders and to international governments of this crime of truly incommensurate proportion. Uh, and, and, and one of the things, Jacek, that you said, that you touched on, uh, I think is one of the most interesting aspects of, of or most remarkable facts uh, that you learn in this show, which is that in 1943, Karski meets with Prime Minister Churchill in London. He meets in America with Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, a Jewish American Man, he meets with President Roosevelt. And uh, when we were doing the talk back today, Clark, this for the matinee, someone asked a question about uh, what Karski was hoping would happen from this conversation with Roosevelt. And also this theme of international leaders meeting with Karski and hearing what he's saying, but not necessarily being able to believe the truth of what he's saying. That, that he's this camera, he's this recorder, he, he bears witness to these unspeakable sights uh, and experiences and they hear it and it, it doesn't go in one ear and out the other necessarily, but it's not fully comprehended at the time that he says it. Is that, how did, so, so why, how did you decide to incorporate these scenes into the show, which are really in some ways the climax of, of, of the entire piece? Well, it's it's a it's such a central uh, part of Karski's sense of his own failure um, in this mission and uh, uh, what he internalized um, and then became silent, um, didn't speak about his experiences for 35 years. So the question always became, um, especially when we started to sort of conceive of this project, 
uh, in um, 2014 uh, was, you know, how do you dramatize someone who's reluctant to speak um, because of what he experienced? And the best way we could was to sh use Karski's own skills to, uh, to dramatize it. And his skills were about clinical concrete reproduction, as he put it. Um, his meeting with Felix Frankfurter, where he simply says, you know, what he's seen in the ghetto and, and in the transit camp. And Frankfurter says, uh, I, I don't believe you. Uh, he says, I'm, I don't say that you're lying. I say, I don't believe you. These are different things. I don't believe that humanity is capable of such things. Uh, FDR is a trickier question. Someone who, with whom he meets for, you know, a, a half an hour and is able to convey his information as a good messenger does. And FDR simply says, you know, thank you. Does not ask one simple specific question, as he says, about the Jewish problem. And Karski leaves and walks out into Lafayette Park wondering, uh, you know, have I finished? Have I accomplished my mission? Uh, and, and sort of is left you know, dealing with that for almost 35 years of silence until he begins to speak again about his experience, particularly in light of Holocaust denial um, in the 70s. And, uh, and then uh, Derek, David and I started to pour over uh, many oral histories where Karski again started to speak about these experiences, including his remarkable journey up to the point of becoming a courier for the Polish underground with this kind of question of what makes someone uh, this both uh, heroic uh, and also selfless. These two things that sort of sometimes in our culture of, of sort of identifying what heroism looks like sometimes seem in contrast with each other. Yeah, and, and uh, this idea of, of him finally gaining his voice after being silent uh, for so many years uh, in reaction to these extraordinarily ambiguous encounters that you depict, I think, uh, in this remarkable way in the show. It's almost like you can't believe the words that are coming out of Frankfurter's or Roosevelt's mouth. Uh, Grace Ann, before before we go to Derek and Ijoma, there's a is there a comment or a question from our from our viewers? Yeah, and um, we don't have to answer this now. Maybe you all can think about this as you speak. But there's a question from viewer Lynn, who Clark she picks up on what you say about Karski's sense of failure on his mission. And for anyone on, from the sort of creative team of the show. Um, how did you balance his sense of failure with a sense of hopefulness um, that's definitely imbued within the piece? Um, Clark, I don't know if you want to answer that or if, if anyone wants to let that ruminate a little bit more, but I wanted to make sure Lynn's question got in there. I, I can answer it briefly only because I, I was asked something similar uh, this, uh, this afternoon's talk back and, and it's a terrific question and one that I think segues into the sort of course that we've co-created um, around Karski's legacy. And, and it's the fact that Karski, after he sat there on that bench quickly and was informed that he couldn't go to, back to Poland because he'd been deciphered, um, chose to become a teacher and chose to teach young minds. And so the other thing that we bore witness to through these oral histories from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, USC Shoah Foundation, his own book, Story of a Secret State, uh, e. Thomas Woods' wonderful biography of Karski was his ability to continue to apply his lessons to a singular tragedy and work with students to make those connections. Uh, and, and, and that for us, and I think I speak for Derek and David, and, and I'll be curious to hear, you know, what all of, you know, how all of us respond to that question, because it really is a complicated one, uh, is that by leaning into sort of the professor of Karski theatrically and engaging with the audience as students and then getting to teach a course with young people, we're trying in our, in our way to sort of carry on that hopefulness that Karski chose to become a teacher. I think before we get to, uh, many hands popping up, so uh, uh, lots of responses, but I think before we get to the, the course, because certainly we want to talk about that, I think Derek Clark was mentioning that the process of developing this piece, and I think it's worth talking a little bit about that because it's been, I think, what, a seven year long process and one that arose out of a centennial celebration at Georgetown. And it's something we've talked about, the fact that there is a statue on Georgetown campus of Karski sitting on a bench. Uh, and there are statues of Karski all around the world, in fact. Mm -hmm. And yet there's not, there wasn't, I think, at the time that you started this, uh, a recognition in the Georgetown community of the importance maybe of Karski, uh, which is something that maybe led to the creation of this piece. So if you could walk us a little bit through 
how this pro how this project started uh, and what it's evolved into, some of the discoveries maybe that you made along the way. I'd be fascinated to hear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Drew. Um, yeah, it it started in 2014 when which was um, when Car the centennial of Karski's birth, which was being commemorated on Georgetown's campus. Um, I had a background as a Holocaust educator and had done some other projects that thematically resonated, some of them actually engaging with, um, with Poland, a play called Our Class that we did at Theater J and that I had, had sent me to Poland and some other, some other work. And so uh, I was reached out to as, um, as, a, as a Georgetown professor who engaged in that area to see if we would want to develop something, um, you know, theatrical or performative as part of the, um, the, the um, commemoration. And I was familiar with Karski's story and the bench and the outlines of it, but I was by no means at that point, and you know, it was it was a little bit of a of a like, oh, what an opportunity to dig in deeper and understand this. And I um, uh, quickly realized that it was an incredibly uh, deep, complex, you know, sort of like you know, had that encounter with just the sort of resonance of the material and. Um, and reached out and meet the two people I reached out to are the two deep, deepest co-collaborators on the piece, Clark and David. Um, Clark, who had been a former student and then what by then was a really deeply trusted professional collaborator on many projects and David, who I'd had the privilege of working with previously and just immediately um, felt a sense of sort of spiritual affinity between my understanding of Karski and a sense of David's own um, humility and just approach to the work. And so those were the two people I reached out to. We were very fortunate that David not only said yes, but was already familiar with Karski and had a kind of, had seen Shoah, remembered Karski and had a kind of, you know, it wasn't just a, oh, sure, let's see what that is. He already, there was a kind of, so that was, that was a, a key moment. Um, and just to say quickly, the, the initial version that we developed for a stage reading that just had like three or four days of rehearsal at Georgetown, the conception was David played Karski and we had Georgetown students who in essence were playing students of Karski. Um, and they became, um, you know, as an ensemble, they ended up playing the different roles that now in the solo version, many of them are still kind of embedded in the roles David himself plays, the kind of figures of Karski's journey and of Karski's life. And so I think one of the things that was there from the beginning, and this connects to Ijoma's role with us, whatever, is a sense that Karski as teacher and that the theatrical occasion of the classroom as a transformative space, as a space that Karski chose to be transformational and was transformational within, was always the container for this, you know, in, in many ways, even though it's shifted from an ensemble version to a solo version, the, the bones of that choice are still at the core of the, of the production now. Um, so, so that's the origin. We've had many. We were in Poland along the way and in other places developing it. Um, and But the other thing is, on one hand, it's been seven years, but obviously we work in fits and starts and years go by where we're not working on it. And this is still very much a beginning for us. This is not a production that has like toured around and been seen by a lot. We're actually really premiering it at the Shakespeare Theater. We had just before COVID done these kind of one-off performances, both at, at DC as part of the School of Foreign Service Centennial at Georgetown and then one in London. But this is our first run of this show. And so it's actually so gratifying to feel finally like we are night in and night out, like meeting a community of people who are responding to it. We've we've had these sort of flashpoint moments before, but this is our first sustained experience with an audience, and so it's been it's been really hugely gratifying. And also, we're just learning a ton about how the legacy of Karski is felt here in in the DC community. Well, and one of the one of the fascinating things about removing the ensemble of students from the stage is that the audience, of course, becomes the students of Jan Karski, which is very much the theatrical frame for the show now is exactly. Karski addressing the audience as his students, uh, which leads directly to this question about bearing witness to the lessons and the legacy of Jan Karski 
today. So Joma, I think it would be, be wonderful to hear a little bit about how this course at Georgetown uh, has developed in concert with this project. Because uh, I believe this is the second year you're teaching the course. The first year was during the pandemic. Uh, and, and, and also in concert with the performances on stage at the Shakespeare Theater. How do we understand the lessons that Karski is teaching to us today? And maybe what might, what might he want us to be doing uh, today? I realize those are maybe slightly different questions, uh, yeah. but there are, so many, there are so many ideas that are being stirred up in my mind right now. So I'm sorry for, for just giving you the poo poo platter, if you will. Yeah. Um, no, those are, those are all great questions. So yeah, happy to chat a little bit about the class. So um, yeah, as you, as you indicated, we ran um, the class for the first time last fall, so about a year ago. And that was, yeah, in the midst of the pandemic. Um, we're at Georgetown, the university was you know, sort of fully remote in terms of teaching our classes. Um, but something about that actually ended up facilitating for us, um, you know, I, I think just a really, a really prime opportunity to interact with students in a really particular way. Um, you know, I think one thing that we, we sort of focus on in the course is, you know, we have students engage with the performance, um, and so they they watch it. Um, you know, it's and but the course itself is is less about the sort of the history of Karski, but sort of thinking about um, you know what it means for students to engage with a piece of art um, and sort of what that can teach them, particularly in the context of being students at Georgetown. Um, you know, we weren't able to do this last year because we were not on campus, but you know, for our class this semester we meet at the Karski bench. Um, you know, we've been holding our class sessions there and um, sort of engage sort of with Karski or sort of, you know, are talking about our readings and, and sort of things like that, um, sort of in, in proximity to that statue, which, um, you know, I think is, is something that, yeah, for me as an educator, I think is really unique to sort of be thinking about that. Um, but yeah, we, um, as I mentioned, we sort of are, are asking our students to see what resonates for them, um, especially during the, the pandemic, um, and our, our, our class last year, you know, I, I think, um, you know, our, our, our students are, are young people, um, but they're also very smart people. And so they're, they're sort of very cognizant of the ways in which there are issues or challenges in the world that they want to address and are also sort of trying to figure out how to do that, um, especially, especially students at Georgetown. You know, that's their, a lot of them are very sort of action driven in that way. And so to see the kinds of ways, you know, and avenues, we, you know, we essentially ask them, you know, what where are you bearing witness to something in your lives that, you know, where you think you can draw from Karski's example and apply it in, you know, sort of an issue. And the things that students brought back, um, you know, talking about climate change, talking about, um, talking about racism um, and anti-racist work, social justice, um, anti-Semitism, you know, the ways in which they brought that back to sort of modern examples um, was actually just really, really very moving for us to see how they, as you know, students at Georgetown were able to um, think about how to sort of apply this very Georgetown legacy of, of Jan Karski. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously one of the larger questions that the piece raises, which is, which is not about the specifics of what happened in 1943 in the Warsaw Ghetto. Obviously those are deeply, deeply important questions and should never be forgotten, right? But the phenomenon, of Holocaust-like activities that are glossed over as part of the political status quo, the maintenance of the political status quo that are happening all the time uh, as we speak today. And this, this larger um, call to action in some ways that the, that the example of Karski uh, offers to us is what are, what are we ignoring? What are we walking past ignoring or not sitting on a park bench and acknowledging uh, that is going on right now, what, what should be spoken up about right now, which comes through very, very vividly and palpably in the show. And in some ways is one of the, one of the profound lessons uh, of Karski. Sorry, that's not a question. It's just the, one of the inspiration, one of the things I, I, I'm taking inspiration from. The other thing, David, uh, yes, Grace Ann. Well, no, I don't, I just have another question from a viewer kind of about the timeline of Karski's story. Yes, you know? please, please save me yeah. from my pontificating. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, <laughs> Randy and Misty have asked um, if someone from the team could remind us why Karski was silent for so long before he started talking about it. Where in his sort of journey did he, what inspired him to maybe break his silence and why was it that long? I know Yatek, if, 
if you wanted to speak to that, um, you raise your hand there. That's it. Yes. Um, yes. Um, you know, uh, I. Sorry that I will be talking about myself here, but you know, I started working uh, in the Holocaust Museum in 1988, and uh, I'm from a family of survivors. You know, my mother, who is still alive, almost a hundred years old, went through all all of that, and I never wanted to even know about it or or anything, and. Uh, in 1988, when the museum started to uh, be uh, a real project you know, in in the National Mall, uh, we started and we started believing that this is the Holocaust 15 minutes. That you know people will forget about it, as they did prior to that time. Prior to that time, if you went to any library in in the world, you would find few books on the subject of Holocaust. They were so, you could count uh, the scholars who dealt with the subject of Holocaust on, on the hands of, on, on, the, on the fingers of one hand, really. And uh, Karski, of course, in that um, climate, didn't talk about it. And then uh, the, the film Shaw came up and it was one of the first awakenings and Karski was a huge part of it. And only after uh, the, the, the showing of the film Shaw, uh, did Karski's prominence and did Karski's role come to uh, come up with this. So I think that this is the, the, re the main reason that he was silent for all those years, because he did not have uh, ears that would want to, to listen to him. Um, also, Karski is, uh, this is a, a mind boggling thing for, for me all the time that to, to understand what the Holocaust was, it's really a very difficult concept. It is something that what uh, the, 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 uh, the Justice Frankfurter said, I cannot believe because this is it, it's incomprehensible, you know, you cannot, you cannot uh, see that. And Karski understood it already in 1943. You can see this in his writings from that time. You could see in his uh, reports of that time. He saw the difference between what war is a terrible thing, but what was happening to the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, in the Belgian camp, in Treblinka, etc., it was something that was beyond any description, and he knew that. And this is, I think, another one of the reasons that, thank you, Jacek, for sharing that. Uh, the one-man show dramaturgy forces the audience to imagine the Holocaust instead of representing it in a more straightforward, realistic manner. And, and of course, this is a subject that is often debated in our theory of what is the correct way of representing uh, this specific atrocity, but atrocities in general, by by representing them, do you, in some sense or in some fashion, make them understandable and legible? Uh, and is it actually better to involve an audience in a process of imagining them, uh, seeing them in all their complexity? Uh, so it's a sort of a it's a debate that's that's not necessarily resolved, but I think it's it's very well handled. Uh, in this show. And, and, and as you, one of the things that a couple of you have talked about is this sense of um, survivor's guilt that, that um, Karski had. He calls himself in the show, Clark, a, an insignificant little man. Uh, and he talks about this figure, uh, Shmuel Ziegelboim, who's one of the leaders of the Polish government in exile. Is that right? Or is it the Jewish, is it the, the Jewish government of the Poles in exile uh, who plays a very prominent role in his story? Yeah, Schmuel, Schmuel Ziegelboim in many ways was one of the uh, major, uh, uh, he cracked open the, the narrative of the play for us uh, uh, when we discovered his history, particularly when we were traveling to Poland and began to work Ziegelboim's narrative in, but we're still struggling with it well into the sort of one man version of the show. Schmuel Ziegelboim was um, a uh, leader, um, of the uh, Bund, 
um, uh, underground um, in exile in London. And his whole family was in uh, Warsaw <clears throat> at the time while he was representing his people. Uh, Karski reported to him about what he saw and as Ziegelboim articulated to him uh, quite, you know, for, for Karski as he describes it quite angrily was that I know this already, but what do you want me to do? I don't, I don't know what to do. And, uh, and Karski uh, tells him what uh, the representatives in, who are witnessing people dying uh, abroad in Poland uh, want him to do, which is to stand in the streets and refuse food, refuse drink, uh, uh, proclaim a hunger strike and die in view of all mankind so that people, that you will shake the conscience of the world. And Karski leaves Ziegelboim uh, um, only to learn that Ziegelboim committed suicide uh, in 1943 um, in profound protest of uh, the inaction, as he says, that the uh, world watches and permits, which I think is a sort of beautiful rhetorical uh, uh, choice by Ziegelboim, the, that the world watches and permits the destruction of the Jewish people. He says, my life belongs to the Jewish people of Poland and therefore I give it to them now. And that suicide is something that stayed with Karski forever. And Karski, even in his silence, which I think speaks also to his humility, always spoke about Ziegelboim to his students and made sure that Ziegelboim was known. And I think that connects to his his quote unquote insignificance, which is that he saw and bore witness to the pain um, that, was, that was deeper than his own sense of being a messenger um, and witnessed a person who, who, who truly did, uh, uh, was truly, um, as he said, uh, re, uh, would, um, oh boy, now I'm thinking about the lines. I gotta remember the lines. It's been locked in here too long. Uh, that he says that um, Ziegelboim represents the indifference of the world, that when I go to the war experience, I don't go to my own, I go to Ziegelboim. Um, and when we began to discover that aspect of what haunted Karski, uh, I think we began to understand a little more deeply his own humility, his own sense of completion of the task, and his true trauma uh, um, in, in the effects of what he told and on whom he told. Right, it's, what, it's one of many such stories in the piece where Karski is relaying also the stories of all these other people that he encountered who did not survive, and he did. And he's there to tell the story, but there is the sense that he is humbling himself, that he is the holder of all of these other uh, stories. And if there's something really beautiful, Derek, and. Ijeoma, I'm curious for your thoughts about the way David renders this in the show, because you get the sense that he himself is effacing all of the David Strathairn qualities and just serving as a, a transmitter or a camera for these other stories to come through him. It's a really remarkable uh, way that he's so completely uh, effaced in the, face of, in the face of this story and all these other stories of people. Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of a beautiful paradox about Karski and a beautiful paradox about David. We think about, you know, the notion of the hero or even of the one person show. And clearly this performance is completely buoyed by David's virtuosity and by, in a sense, Karski's virtuosity. As a, um, and yet the, the particular quality of you know the way that that self-effacing way of becoming kind of a vessel or a conduit is you know the reason why there's something that feels kind of ineffable and we have from the very beginning from the first time and I, I wish I could say that I was like you know that that first idea of like oh I'll call David like about Karski was as was you know as prophetic as you know, but it was so gratifying. And I remember the feeling on that first time in Gaston, because I didn't know Karski. We had looked at the videos, whatever, but we were performing for his former students and for a community of colleagues and people who cared about and knew and remembered Karski. And people came up to me, came up to David, came up to Clark, trembling, like really, really like, and we're like, I mean, my colleague Tony Aaron, we're like, it was as if he had been lifted from the dead or, you know, like that's a, um, and I think that isn't so much, there is physical resemblance to a degree, but I think there's something more, the deeper thing is the thing you're describing, Drew, which is some quality of what Karski describes as the camp, you know, 
being the camera, <laughs> um, the recorder. And I do think that speaks for David's process also is one of like a really deep, profound listening that's not just mimesis or emulation and isn't about look what I can do to sort of take a spin on this, but is actually a really um, profound. And it's been amazing over the years to watch him just kind of like whittle and deepen like kind of as he listens more deeply to Karski and he's still listening. I mean, we Clark and I were talking about this today. Like he's what he's doing in between shows is like listening to Karski, like literally is listening to Karski um, in a way that feels very, very deep. It's not just a like, Oh, I'm going to look for a trip. Like it's a, it's a, um, it's almost a spiritual kind of uh, a conduit sort of. Um, so anyway, that's, um, yeah, that's, yeah. It's, uh, like a, it's like a tuning fork or something. A there's, a, there's, a cent- yeah. there's a centered quality to David's performance and he's trying to find this vibration. And, and I, love, like, I you, love that, Drew. I love that. Yeah. And you were saying uh, uh, after opening I, night that, that you recognized Karski in the yes. performance. And I think that yes, that might definitely. be what you're talking and, about. And, uh, you know, I do remember the first rendition of this, of the show with the students, uh, et cetera. And this is the time when when David was um, studying the accent. And uh, for me, his accent was all the time, not Polish, but Hungarian. I think that it's easier to make a Hungarian accent than Polish in it. But in this, uh, in the show now, it's, it's amazing because it is as if you hear Karski, his uh, pronunciations, his... Uh, it, it he he really studied the person, and uh, there are not too many films to study it from. Uh, the Shaw definitely. There was a BBC interview also made with Karski in the eighties, etc. But it is remarkable how uh, he studied, and this is it. It goes beyond the physicality of the voice and uh, movements, etc. It is a, a really a deep understanding who the person was. He really studied him and 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 knows who he is. And uh, we we were remarking that if Karski saw it, he would have loved it. Well, so uh, so we've we've gone well past the half hour mark, and I, I, I'm due to make a, a short, quick announcement because I could obviously sit here and talk about Karski all night. Uh, this is our last episode of the Shakespeare Hour Live in this calendar year of 2021. But on your screen now, I believe Gordon is putting up all of the episodes that we have scheduled for you throughout spring 2022. Or if he's not putting it up, uh, that will be in the the newsletter that we mail out on Friday. Uh, We hope to see you at the theater for each of these productions and with us here on Zoom to explore each of the shows in our season with uh, with, with the depth and the vigor that the Shakespeare Hour Live is known for. Uh, I do want to get to some selections of text uh, from our guests because we do, we do always love when we can hear some of the words uh, of Shakespeare or of other writers. Uh, and and uh, Jacek, you were saying you actually had a, a speech that was not in the play. That is, that is a famous speech that Karski made in 1943. So I'm dying to know uh, what is this speech uh, from 1943 Karski's own words that, that we're going about to hear. And that, I will be reading from a document that comes from the one of the Polish archives in London. And this is uh, the, the, the text that Karski wrote for the BBC broadcast about his mission. And uh, the interesting part of this is that it says and the, uh, on the margins of that for the recently reruns of the way the, the Arthur Kestler will be reading it because Karski's accent was deemed too strong for the BBC listeners. So another great uh, person of the 20th century, Arthur Kestler, was actually reading this. The, um, uh, the, the fragment that I will read from that is uh, talking about the difference between the Polish and the Jewish suffering. And that is a testimony how how well he understood. So I'm quoting here. As the Poles, they try to reduce to a medieval race of serfs 
They want to deprive us of our cultural standards, of our traditions, of our education, and reduce us to a nation of robots. But the policy toward the Jews is different. It is not a policy of subjugation and oppression, but of cold and systemic extermination. It is the first example in modern history that a whole nation, not 10, 20, or 30, but 100% of them are meant to disappear from this earth. For someone in 1943 to understand this so well, it is to me remarkable. Yeah, you can hear immediately that he, he understands the, the categorical difference between yes. what is happening to the Jews of Europe. Uh, haunting. Uh, Joma, I'm wondering if um, how this conversation is resonating with you and also if there's a, a, a piece of text or a quote that you wanted to highlight from Remember This, uh, maybe to bring it into dialogue with what's happening in the world uh, today. I'm just curious to hear. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's interesting that you you wonder about a quote that sort of reflects on what's resonating in the world. And, and, and I think for me, um, I'm actually uh, thinking about a quote that, that resonates with me sort of personally. Uh, there's a line that um, I think maybe comes from Karski, just, you know, from an interview in the student newspaper, Georgetown from the Hoya, but it, it features in the play about it haunts me now and it, I want it to be so. Um, I think for me, it, it, I, I find it actually resonates like personally with me, um, you know, obviously in, in sort of my own applications in my own life, um, particularly as somebody who, um, you know, is, is uh, I would describe myself as being someone who's amid, you know, breathing um, and uh, sort of grieving loss. And I feel like something about that quote actually really sort of resonates around that particular process of, um, you know, not feeling like, you know, one sort of either, you know, had enough time to sort of do the types of things that one wanted to do or, or sort of feel robbed of something um, or that something's missing. And so, you know, obviously it's not uh, strictly in the way that, that Karski means it um, in, in the play or, or even in this particular you know, interview, um, you know, I, I think he's sort of speaking more to what he, he views as his own um, sort of failures or not doing enough work, but um, something about that like it resonates with me uh, just sort of, you know, deeply, very, very personally. And um, yeah. yeah, that line always sticks out for me from the, from the show. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Cause there was that earlier question about where do, where does one find hope amidst this story? Uh, and I think the quote that you're highlighting there, I, I see hope in that. Uh, it's, it's sort of in some ways a metric of one's humanity that they can feel pain through remembrance, right? That they can be haunted because if we're just indifferent to this, if we're complacent, if we're ignoring it, that means that we're no longer human, that we're no longer, uh, that, we ha that we have given up uh, our morality on, on some level. Uh, right. And you know, th th this, yeah. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah, I think I, yeah, definitely, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah, it's sort of, a, it, 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 it reflects or sort of suggests that, that one has, has feelings, that they care, that there is, is love and there's compassion. Um, and, and that you want to, to remember something. Yeah, and you know, it, what Derek, you were saying earlier about performing this piece for a community. One of the remarkable things about performing the show in DC is all of the students of Karski from over the many decades, from the 70s, from the 80s, who have been coming to the show and talking about exactly this, right? Exactly about uh, not just the man and not just the specific things that were taught in his classes, but about um, being haunt the, the haunting example that he sets and how he has stayed with them. And that's a marker of their own humanity. So it does feel in a sense that we're, we're continuing this tradition uh, by, by holding these performances and holding this space uh, to remember him. But quote, does Derek have a quote or does Clark have a quote? <laughs> I am. Um... You know what? I was really moved. I read. I was really. It was interesting to read the, this prompt and to think about because obviously there's so many things from Karski himself that, as co-writers of the play, that Clark and I at different points have been like, this is the center of. And there's so many things that resonate. But I was sort of struck by the invitation or the implicit invitation to think about Shakespeare because we are at the Shakespeare Theater and then we're going to the Chicago Shakespeare Theater. 
and I was thinking about, um, you know, it's, it's actually resonant with me and meaningful that the first two th significant venues for the finished production are these Shakespeare theaters to think about um, uh, the, uh, the sort of, in a sense, the classical dimensions of this story, on one hand, incredibly intimate and historical and a one person show, Shakespeare didn't write one person plays, but he did, you know, we have soliloquies, we have these intimate encounters with the psychology of characters like Hamlet who comes out to the audience and we get let into the mind of a, of a character inside a larger world. And so um, I thought about uh, I took the invitation to be like, where, what Shakespeare does this, does this Karski story make me think about? And, uh, um, and I thought about The Winter's Tale, which is one of my, you know, very favorite plays and, and a play I've directed. And for two reasons, um, you know, in The Winter's Tale, you, you go through, there is, you go through this, the first half of the play is this relentless, tumultuous kind of darkness of injustice and in a way there's an inversion of some of the Karski story I'd say because we like you know Hermione is you know we, it, it, there's a known injustice um that is at the sort of like core of 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 everything um and then we come out and there's this quote that I've always loved which is which is simple which is uh thou metst with things dying and I with things newborn which is when the kind of winter becomes the spring and there's some sense of like the spark of life that's going to be the engine for the rest of the piece and i feel like these questions we keep getting at the theater about like hope and like what the curriculum is and like what we're doing here and what the thing is is a kind of you know and karski's own journey was is a kind of thou midst with things dying like we have been through this and what ijom is talking about with grief we've been through this, you know, tumultuous, and I'm not making an analogy between the events of the Winter's Tale and, you know, but we've been through this, this, uh, you know, completely um, unimaginable horror, and yet there's life and a blossom and something on the other side that we now have to kind of move forward with. So I feel like that's, you know, I feel like it's a, there's something for me about the power of, of doing this play in a space where these great plays and great texts have resonated and that Karski belongs in that tradition in his own particular way. Yeah, that, that is of course the scene uh, with the famous stage direction exit pursued by a bear uh, in which Antigonus is eaten by a bear. Uh, he is the thing that is dying. Uh, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's the seacoast of Bohemia. It's interesting uh, that there is such an extreme disparity between despair and hope in that play. And I think that also is living within, within this, this work as well. And it is, it is interesting just zooming back that, that two Shakespeare theaters are doing a, a project like this as we emerge uh, from the pandemic. It, I, I think you're right, Derek, that it speaks to something foundational to theater ever since, you know, the first actor Thespis stood out from the Greek tragic chorus and, and enacted the first one man show, right? Um, so I think there is something deeply classical at, at the heart of this, this piece. Uh, Clark, I'm, I'm curious to hear, uh, yeah, your thoughts. Uh, I, I, I think I'll, I, I chose something that was less hopeful and more pursued by a bear, to be honest with you. <laughs> and for that, I, I, I apologize. I don't wanna, I, you know, I, I, I hope that we don't end on that note, but it is something that I feel is, is, is very important. And it's a quote by Shmuel Ziegelboim uh, that is, is not also in the play. Uh, but I've been thinking a lot about it in um, the context of being frustrated, being on Zoom, or sitting below a theater of of masked folk, and and wondering um, when our leaders will help us uh, uh, use moral courage to get us um, uh, uh, toward a path of truth rather than convenience. Toward um, Shmuel Ziegelbaum said. At 11 in the morning, you will begin talking about the anguish of the Jews in Poland. But at one o'clock, they will ask you to halt the narrative so they can have lunch. That is a difference which cannot be bridged. And I think a lot about that uh, when it comes to whether it's political gridlock or it's civilian gridlock, as we all look at each other and not know uh, um, 
I think about it in terms of complacency uh, um, and, and, and my own sense of what I can do and what I choose to do for myself and my own self-interest and what I choose to do for some kind of greater good. And I think that one of the things that's sort of remarkable about Karski is that he very rarely did things that were good for himself. He did things that he felt were good for others. And, um, and that's something that Shmuel Ziegelboim was up against when he began to talk about the anguish of the Jews. And those in that room would say, we need to stop because I'm hungry. Yeah, and, and Yatsek, as you were saying, it's remarkable that with right-wing governments, left-wing governments, uh, Karski seemingly always charted a course of complete moral clarity uh, and was never, was never uh, swayed too far to either side. He was always uh, urgent, speaking about urgency. But Grace Sand is telling me that we have a perfect question uh, with which to conclude this conversation. So I'll kick it over to you, Grace Sand. Yeah, just, I thought I was inspired by this question from viewers Suzanne and Gary, um, and I thought it might be nice to hear any final thoughts related to this question before we hit 8.30. But Suzanne and Gary ask um, that, they ask in the opening night talk, talk back that Ijeoma led, there was an interesting discussion about why this was so much more powerful as a live shared experience in a theater, as opposed to the solitary process of reading it in a book. I think we would all agree that even the words on the page on their own are incredibly powerful. Um, and you have all spoken to how powerful David is in the role as Karski. Um, but I just wondered if there were any final reflections on the power of bringing it to life in a shared space, especially after the past 18 months where we've really not been able to do that. Um, so if there were any final reflections on that. Well, I will, I will say that this is why it is great that the Shakespeare Theater is back producing the works of theater, that theater is something that has to happen in a local place and at a specific time. And it's, it's, uh, it is all the art forms, dance, music, poetry in one. Uh, and there's nothing like going to the theater and being part of a community that is seeing something that only happens in that one place and that one time. Uh, so I think that the phenomenological aspects of theater are part of an explanation. I'm, I'm curious if there's other maybe thoughts to it or. Yeah, it, it's just been amazing to be back. I mean, you know, in a, in a, there's a, in the theater again, and I think every every post-show discussion that reality has been commented on and even sort of like applauded in the sort of immediacy and a kind of emotional immediacy of that. And it's interesting hearing David, who of course has built a career that is, you know, he's done other work on stage and other impressive work on stage, but a career that most people know him for through his work on screen, uh, uh, film and television. Um, and obviously anyone who sees his performance will see what an extraordinary stage actor he, he is. And it's a different, it's a different medium. And he talks, he did today about the kind of this electricity and this exchange that is so different than just the relationship to the camera. Um, we have, we you know, have actually shot a, a, a film version of this that we will hope will come out next year. And we think that will be its own intimate, unique viewing experience, but it will not be synonymous in any way with the experience that audiences are having here. And even when we shot the film, we were sort of very conscious that this could in no way replace our vision for what we wanted to happen live in the theater. So we're just separate. But Derek, but Derek, is there a book that people can buy? About remember this? Drew, it's so funny you should raise that question. I just don't know where that came from. There is, um, uh, there is this book, um, which is- uh, um, How convenient, you have it sitting there right on your desk. I do, and it's just been released by Georgetown University Press and it has the play script um, uh, that Clark has put together so uh, beautifully with stills from the film, but most excitingly, it's embedded in a larger volume with contributions from a wide range of contributors that include uh, Madeleine Albright and the amazing Aminata Forna um, and Samantha Power and Timothy Snyder and the eulogy given by Father Leo O'Donovan and Deborah Tannen and Stuart Eisenstadt, 
who spoke at um, who spoke about Roosevelt's influence on the play at one of our post show discussions, and Azar Nafisi, the writer of Reading Lolita in Tehran, who's speaking tonight at our post show discussion. So it's a real compendium of perspectives on Karski, and we're really honored, like, to sort of have our play in that kind of wider. Uh, conversation and so we hope people can pick it up it's in the lobby at the Shakespeare theater or at your at your at your bookseller your online bookseller amazing amazing yeah so so truly uh, an all-star constellation not just of theater artists but of internationally regarded scholars historians political figures uh, Timothy Snyder historian at Yale who's written amazing books on on Poland and World War II uh, so yeah go to the theater see the show buy the book uh, I want to thank all of you my wonderful esteemed guests for joining us tonight. Uh, you have a few more chances to catch Remember This, The Lesson of Jan Karski, which is playing in the Klein Theater until October 17th. Our next episode of the Shakespeare Hour Live, for something completely different, will focus on Once Upon a One More Time, the new musical featuring the songs of none other than Britney Spears. We hope you will join us on Wednesday, January 5th, 2022. And last but certainly not least, I want to take a moment to recognize the contributions of my soon-to-be former colleague, Grace Ann Roberts, who uh, will be leaving the Shakespeare Theatre Company, sadly. We're all very sad that she's leaving us. Friday is her last day. Uh, but she has, she has made the Shakespeare Hour Live the, the roaring success that it is. I'm sure that she will go on to probably be all of our boss someday. Uh, Grace Ann, you have, you have my respect. You have my admiration. Are there any final words that you would like to leave our Shakespeare Hour Live audience with? Uh, no, I just want to, that's just been the most amazing experience over the past 18 months. I really cannot say enough good things about spending every Wednesday with, with all of you watching. And um, I, though I won't be at the Shakespeare Theater anymore, I will definitely be tuning in on Wednesdays moving forward and in the chat with you all still. So um, I'm absolutely cheering Drew and Simon and everyone at STC on um, from afar. So I just can't say thank you enough. Thank you all. So you will go from behind the camera, no, you will go from in front of the camera to behind the camera. Yes. Uh, so we can't <laughs> yeah. wait for you to join us in the chat. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Grace Ann. It's, it, we will miss you, uh, honestly. Um, but thank you all again. And without further ado, good night.